Alliance. Supporting all 32 counties through the Alliance Leagues. Hello and welcome to the Throwing Independent.ie's GA podcast in association with Alliance. I'm Will Sattery. Delighted to be joined, as always, by Michael Verney. Michael, hello. How's it going, Will? Yeah, doing well. Another very busy weekend. Uh, it's kind of overwhelming on a Monday morning to, to prepare for this show. There's so many matches to get through. But from, for, from your perspective, Offaly just cannot stop winning. This must be like <laughs> the best you've felt since 2000. <laughs> Ladies football, camogie, hurling football and Shane Lowry top five finish in the US PGA. Like, <laughs> as, as weekends go, they don't get much better than that. I know. It, 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 I was actually just keeping an eye on the results just because it, it's just because there's been so many weekends since we've started this podcast that awfully have just gotten like massive hidings in, in either or both on the same weekend. So, God, yeah, you really have a pep in your step now these days. Yeah, well, it's nice to have something positive to talk about in fairness and just f- focusing on the hurlers even for, for a moment. Like that was a, another really good win down away in Carlo and the footballers have put themselves in, in pole position for uh, for a semi-final spot as well. Really interesting that... Uh, Division three South Group, you're looking at you know it's a three way kind of a, a battle between themselves and Tipperary and Limerick. Interesting actually, Limerick were three points uh, three points down at the end of that game against Offaly and had a chance to maybe go for a goal from a, a you know a thirty yard free and actually put it over with the idea of score difference potentially helping them through to a, a semi final. So it's just that's how that, it all it's so interesting. There's so many different little facets going on. Even uh, you know, Waterford getting a big win away to Wexford at the weekend. Shane Ronan having suffered a big defeat the first week. There's so much going on. It's hard to keep uh, on top of it all, but it's it's so great to have it back and trying to jam it all into an hour is, is uh, a tough task. Yeah, it was funny just looking through the uh, the tables and the football. Like, there's so many delicately poised groups, and there could be like a, a three way tie. You know, in some instances where I think it will come down to score difference then, because I think it's is it head to head maybe if it's two teams and score difference if it's three or I, I think yeah, that, head yeah. To, head to head yeah if it is yeah. So it's um yeah it's it's great. There's like nearly every group is has got a lot to play for in the la- in the last game, and maybe you might you mightn't say that was the case if it was a group of seven. You'd usually have a fair idea who are going to be the top two going into the last round. Even. Yeah, so we're going to be joined by Dick Turk and Frank Roach to go over the football action and Ursula Jacobs swapping in for Dick uh, for the hurling discussion. But first, so the ladies football league is up and running now as well. Uh, you know, good win for Dublin over Waterford at the weekend. The standout, Hannah Tyrrell, Irish Rugby International netting 1-5. It's, it, there's so many versatile players playing ladies football and, and a few in Camogie as well that are going between the sports. I know your own county, Offaly, I think, uh, had a similar uh, versatile player over the weekend who was very good in both those games. It's, it's very interesting to see. Yeah, as if as if Dublin needed any more aces in their pack. It looks like they've they've unearthed another one in Hannah, Hannah Tyrrell. Yeah, uh, Gron Egan is similar with Offaly. She scored one nine for the footballers on Sunday, having scored three five for the for the Camogie team on Saturday, which is which is absolutely outstanding. Yeah, um, it's hard to keep track on everything that's going on at the mo- at, at the moment. But yeah, a good good win for Dublin uh, over Waterford. You would have been expected them to win quite comfortably, and, and they hit six fifteen. So. Uh, interesting when we talk about like dual players it'll be interesting to see whether Arlo Dwyer is back for the for the tip ladies footballers later on the year having won uh, having won uh, and it's not AFL but women's women's AFL medal already so yeah there's so many talented dual players in there just trying to trying to fit everything in I suppose yeah and I suppose if in the ladies football league, you're kind of looking to see if anyone can emerge as a challenger to Dublin who've been so successful. So similar to the to the men's as well. Um, you know, Donegal beating Westmead over the weekend, Mayo Edge in Galway. So it was Donegal, I remember, very unlucky to lose that championship game to Dublin the with ghost, the ball. The ghost goal, yeah, yeah. The strangest goal I have ever seen in, Ga- in Gaelic football or, or ladies football in this case. Uh, so yeah, um, I'd be another will, wouldn't they? Yeah, I was so yeah. close. Like, uh, and obviously, Amy Mackin's one of the best footballers in the country. So it's really interesting to see if anybody outside of Cork kind of really steps up I'd say Armagh would, would fancy their chances of giving Dublin a good rattle this year Yeah no interesting just was just, just it's only just up and running now so it'll be interesting to follow it over the next few weeks for now we're going to turn our attention to Gaelic football we're delighted to have Dick Clark and Frank Roach with us guys how are things? Good morning well all good yeah, and Dick, I suppose last week we we were pretty excited about the Dublin Kerry game, even though it's an early season league encounter and, you know, we were kind of chatting a bit off air. It took a while to, to warm up to the Dublin Kerry games we maybe expected over the last few years, but but what a finish. We got 4-9 to 118 in the end, another draw, under third draw in the last four meetings. Um, from your perspective, you know, what, what's your big takeaway from the game? I, I, how much are you reading into it in terms of maybe a later on in the summer kind of thing? Yeah, 
I think they can read plenty. And if you're just looking at the date here, it's the 24th of May. It's not like March or, or February. Like, there's not a huge amount of time between where we're at now and, and, and championship. And so, so teams and managers will be sort of keen to sort of take as much as they can in terms of form, fitness, tactics. There's not an awful lot of time to change a whole pile. So, you know, I think even just listening to the guys in the Sunday game last night, they would have felt that Dublin would have been happier. I, I would disagree with that. I would think, you know, Peter King looking at the way that's... You know, that that game was Dublin's, you know, forty minutes in, they were six points up. You know, Mike, you're a, a betting man, you know, betting in running. What would you got? Fifty to one on for Dublin at, at six points up. Well, you and know, it would have been heavy, heavy odds heavy. on. Like when when have they when have they let a lead like that go before in any game? I can't remember it. The only one I was just thinking that, and the only one I could recall was Donegal in fourteen. They were five up. I could never yeah. think of a game they were six it, up in and 2015 didn't win it. in the drawn game against Mayo. They had a six or seven point lead at the end, the, and Mayo ended up drawing right. the game. Yeah, was so very rare. Like a six, very, seven very years rare. Ago. Yeah, very rare. No, still didn't lose, but but not to close it out, especially like they did look to have a serious stranglehold. Like Kerry were sort of struggling to to get any traction around the middle third. David Clifford was largely subdued and just double up in control, and but then. Boom, just within a sort of a, a five minute period, Kerry found a bit of energy. Clifford stepped up, and then all the momentum just shifted. And you could see it right through the Kerry team. A few fresh legs definitely added a wee bit of, of forward momentum. And um, yeah, I think draw was fair, but Dublin would be sort of wondering we should be winning that. It doesn't matter. Can't be making excuses with younger players because. They've been doing that for the last 10 years, bleeding in younger players that mightn't have the have the experience and it hasn't, you know, knocked them back. So they can't be using that when it suits. They had enough big players there to get the job done. They didn't. Now, and the same token, Kerry would look at that game. That's we drew the game, but mother of God, look at the goals we conceded. You know, if you can at least strip out half of those, that's a six-point swing going into another game, you know, because the goals were really poor if you broke a lot of them down one by one. You just should not be confident. And they should have had another goal themselves that was that was wrongly disallowed. So I think Kerry would be sort of saying, taking a step back, says, right, there was an awful lot good to take out of that in going down the home straight, but we've loads to improve on. Dublin, Dublin done as Dublin do. They played good. They were efficient. By the first 10 minutes, um, they were ruthless in front of goals. They controlled the middle third but they just couldn't close the game out. So they'd be sort of scratching their heads a wee bit. Yeah, Frank, from a Kerry perspective, as Dick outlined there, there was a lot of positives, especially how they really attacked to get back in the game, you know, and didn't even get a goal until the end. So it was all just like working points, scoring opportunities. But the, the goals, they, they conceded four goals. And, and as Dick said, some of them were, were very porous defending, you know, individual errors or just being sliced open. Like, is that is that not the big takeaway from a Kerry perspective, especially given the conversation around the way they set up very defensively against Cork, you know, getting that balance right it's the ultimate conundrum for for peter keen is what does he do i mean the the feeling is that your 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 best chance of beating dublin is is fronting up going man for man as, as mayo did at their peak and went very close and that if kerry do that they have the forwards to hurt dublin and you can argue you can see it again like how often have dublin conceded 118 and it should have been 217 if that goal had been awarded um but there is this huge question mark of goals and, and whether the Kerry defenders, man for man, are good enough. Now, in fairness, one of the three mistakes, the mistake that Paul Murphy made for the third goal uh, that Conor, Conor Callahan scored, I mean, that's not a mistake that you would expect a player of his calibre to make uh, in high summer. But, you know, it's, it's, it's how easily they were unhinged. You know, that trademark Kieran Kilkenny pop pass over the defender's head, Conor Callan running in along the end line. You know, we've seen, team, we've seen Dublin do that before and Kerry just weren't alive to it. So, I mean, it is a huge worry, but I, I still think, I mean, both managers will always look to take the positives out of an outcome. And the big positive for Kerry there is that they were facing Everest, what was it, seven points down against a team that knows how to close out a game. And yet Kerry, you know, they, they, they got back level with points and then they suffered another hammer blow with the goal and they still got something out of the game. So, you know, I think they'll take that. Yeah. 
And Michael, from a Dublin perspective, you know, as, as the lads mentioned on the Sunday game last night, in terms of maybe Dublin had more room to grow in the sense that Stephen Cluxon comes back in, Dean Rock comes back into it, our senior players, Desi Farrell comes back into the sidelines. We, it's hard to quantify how much of an impact that makes, but, you know, in-game strategy is a big part of matches as well and you, you're, you're missing your sideline general. So, you know, what, what's your kind of view on how it's unfolded and, and the aftermath? Yeah, yeah, definitely say that Dublin have more room impro- for improvement from that respect. But I think it's 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 key for Kerry that you know a game that looked as as the boy said it looked like it was you know slowly trickling away from Dublin. We're going to hold the ball. They were going to basically play out the game. We're going to be really really smart. And Kerry were able to turn the tide, which yeah, as which we talked about there, which very few teams have been able to do. So maybe there's a small little crack there that they've shown that they've shown in Dublin. Uh, Kerry really went at them. I think it was I think in the third quarter, Dublin only had three shots on goal in that third quarter. Uh, a third quarter that they'd usually control. So I think from a Kerry perspective, that's very very positive. Um, from the from the Dubs, yeah, they they probably are despite uh, despite some secret training that might have been done, they probably are a bit behind because they were the last finished last year. So they're probably one of, the, one of the last teams back. And as I say, there's an awful lot of room for improvement with guys coming back. But from a Kerry point of view, I think, yeah, I think Kerry are the ones that take positives from this. So yes, Dublin will improve. But what looked like a real lost cause and like a half time, people are probably thinking, like, are we going to even have a championship this year? And all of a sudden things turn around and like, David, like it's amazing to think David Clifford didn't play well and still scored five points from play, which is like, that's the standards. That, give him a seven out of 10 at best, wouldn't you? Yeah, his yeah exactly. Yeah. And that's the yeah. standards that we judge him by now. So like, and like Paul Ganey was relatively quiet too. So like Kerry have a lot, a lot of room for improvement too. While Dublin have a lot of personnel to come back, if Kerry can tighten up at the back and kind of mix that, keeping tight at the back, but taking on Dublin with the attack that they have. I think they have huge for, room for improvement too. So it's, it's, again, it's probably, it's beautifully poised if, should the two of them meet again later on in the year, uh, hopefully in an All-Ireland semi-final or final. Yeah, yeah. It's just, just like David Clifford, it's funny, like some of his more subdued games, do you want to call them, have come against Dublin, the two finals, Michael Fitzsimons did a very good job that day, but similarly, he still kicked three or four points from play in both of those games, and yet he did seem to be shackled for, for, for the majority. But I guess there's one big talking point, and it's something we've talked about a lot over the first two weeks, you know, the advantage rule and the Darren Moynihan moment where he, he finished to the net and then the play was brought back to give a free in. So that's kind of the, the worst case scenario when people were, were discussing the, the negative impacts it could have. Like it was a league game, so it maybe won't get as much attention. But if something similar happened in a Dublin Kerry game in the summer, my Lord, it would be the biggest talking point of the year. Yeah, and, and you know what frustrates me more about the advantage rule? Like over the last two or three years, I was would have been tearing me hair, even back when I was playing, that referees wouldn't give a free maybe 30 yards out. And if the hand up, which 30 yards out at inter-county level is a point, right? That's it. That's, it. that's a point. And there was never a goal chance on. But they'd count down the clock and next thing they'd let the play and they wouldn't come back and let the man take his, his point, which is a much better outcome than letting the play develop and, and the point scoring opportunity goes. And then you see the likes of what happened yesterday. The most obvious way an advantage rule was ever designed for not been implemented. And I don't know, like the referees aren't helping themselves. Like the referees maybe take a step back and have a conversation themselves, lads, because they keep coming out saying, we can implement these rules. Don't worry about us, lads. Here's another rule. We can take it on. And yes, maybe in isolation, they can manage every rule. But the problem is now, there's so many different things a referee have to adjudicate on in real time. There's only so much can, can, can get computed and go through. And it's very easy, even the best will in the world, that mistakes have been made when you've been asked to adjudicate on so many new things at, at once. And I just think, you know, a, a real question, like that should never be in doubt for a referee, that call there. It was most the most obvious case of an advantage rule. Like it used to be hand up, one, two. You, referees used to count it out on the pitch. One, two, <laughs> like two seconds that ball was in the net. But yet there was no. So I, I, I really don't know. I'd really like somebody from the referees committee to come out and explain what's happening in there. And it was just an honest mistake. Fair enough. We'll move on. But if there's a, a change in how they're adjudicating on these things, players need to know because stuff like that really frustrates uh, viewers and players. And uh, I think for everyone's benefit, there needs to be some more clarity on it. Yeah, Frank, because Sean Hurston's reaction, he was kind of like a wry smile as if, here, lads, I have to give this, you know, I didn't yeah. have a choice here. For, like That's what was the most frustrating, as Dick said, there, there was no common sense in that call. Darren Moynihan was like one second away from being cleaned through and putting it into the net. 
But see, the thing is, he didn't have to make that call. I mean, even under the rule as it's reframed, as I can see, if, if a player is running into a goal scoring position, you, you let the advantage, you, you give the advantage. And this wasn't a five second rule. As Dick said, it was a one second thing. The best referees, and you can see it in soccer as well and, and other sports, where, you know, there's that little bit of wiggle room. Strictly speaking, maybe, oh, you see a foul, you blow. You wait a second or two seconds and then you call it back. You know, and no one ever gives out about, uh, you know, a referee calling back in that situation if he is, you know, he's just let the situation develop for a second or two. So, I mean, I just think the really top referee would have held his whistle there and the goal would have stood. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's a symptom probably of the fact that referees are dealing with multiple decisions to make in real time. I was at the Dublin Ross Common game a week previously and, and in fairness, the referee had some very tough calls to make there in relation to, uh, is that a black card? Where was the foul committed? Was it a goal scoring chance? And I would, I would reckon he got it right with the first Dublin penalty and wrong with the second Dublin penalty against Roscommon. But they're really hard calls. You know, you're trying to judge if defenders coming mm-hmm. back or covering and they can stop a goal scoring chance. Whereas yesterday's one I thought was clear cut. Mm. It's even interesting during the week seeing Paul Early reiterate a call that a few people have made for maybe a second referee. I don't know. Would that even make, would that muddy the waters further? Two referees, two different interpretations of, of various incidents. We could be here all day. Yeah. Oh, you can imagine. The, you can imagine the, the manager's reactions afterwards. All we're looking for a bit of consistency from yeah. game to game or from half to half. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good in theory, but no, it's not. Like I think, I think you know there needs to be, and even looking at the Monaghan game on the, on the, on the Saturday night. You know the black cards and and you know it's it's just Russian it's Russian roulette at this stage. You just really don't know what's going to be termed a, a black card or or a yellow card or what way because there's such a big area of grey now, which is not what new rules are supposed to be. Like I think there has to be an element that you know the benefit of, there has to be an element of, of of the benefit of the doubt going to the player. Like people are bemoaning the fact that physicality is going out of the game. And I can tell you as a player, the black card contributed to that because it stopped players committing themselves to a tackle for the fear of a slight mistiming of a shoulder charge or a tackle. Next thing you're in the stand. So instead of committing, you stand back, and that's what you've developed now. This sort of you know guys herding cattle with the hands up. You know, that's that's one of the reasons that is because I'm just as a player that is goes through my head now. Whereas before you would have just committed, go into the tackle, full blooded. No, you don't. You take a step back, you become passive. And then because contact is so infrequent now, when it happens, the referees are feeling that they're obliged to give a card or something. Whereas 10 years ago, that would have just been played on. And I think that's just has developed over the last five years. And it's going to be a slow thing to, to turn back, unfortunately. Michael, just to move back onto on pitch action, the two games in Ulster over the weekend, kind of continuing the trend of you know real free flowing, front foot attacking football. I know people are kind of having a bit of a joke about it because you know maybe it's not traditional Ulster fair, but uh, they've been great games to watch. High scoring, lots of attacking play. Yeah, Dick, what is going on? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh, no, if, if you were still playing, you'd be surging forward, kicking pints the way, the way these games. Are, are you going. saying I didn't? Are you saying I didn't? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember seeing it. Hello, <laughs> but um, no, just they were hugely entertaining. And yeah, brilliant. Like uh, there was probably a couple of things. Like things happened with with Donegal's defence that I've just never seen happen before. Like Conor McCarthy cut through a couple of sidesteps and and dodged three guys there at one stage for one of his goals. But it it does make for a really like open, attractive football. It's so easy on the eye. Um, like even like like the Tyrone game we talked about it last week. Tyrone playing differently. There were there were things tried by Tyrone players that you just wouldn't have seen in, under the previous regime. Whether they were uh, shackled or otherwise, like uh, Darren McCurry going for you know chip pickups. He he took a, he took a shot on from about it must have been three yards out from from the end line and put it over the bar. Uh, they got scored from the outside of the right there near the end as well. Peter Hart's mm. goal. Um, yeah, it just seems to be from the, from a Toronto point of view anyway. There definitely seems to be a, there's a lot. They're allowed to show their flair and they're allowed to express themselves on the ball a lot more. Um, and even like Armagh got some great scores too. I think the Armagh Toronto game really hinged on on Stephen Campbell's penalty. They were one up mm. at the time. Uh, fairness to Niall Morgan, he he judged them really really well. They went down the field and got a score, and the game kind of changed on that. Um, as regards the Monaghan Donegal game. 
from a Donegal point of view, to get a result with Michael Murphy off the pitch so early and conceding four goals is, is a miracle in itself. From a Monaghan point of view, and I know you'll probably come in on the back of this, Dick, to, to lose a game having scored four goals and to, to, to been in a really, you know, when Conor McManus finishes to the next, you're, you look like you're in, you know, you have an unassailable lead. So from, i say, Dick, from a Monaghan point of view, it was, it was very disappointing not to get the two points having been in that position. Yeah, it it was, you know, and, and been told about it like they should have been like some of the chances that they that they missed at the end, like one or two points would have done it. Like Conor McManus himself came on, scored a scored a, a very good goal that was set up from, but he'd look at a few of the chances that he, he, he normally puts away. And maybe he's just a bit rusty, haven't having not played a, a, hu- a huge amount of football. That being said, I suppose a reference that this morning in the Indo, you know, a lot of modern people would have been a bit concerned going up the road. Um, that's just the team's young and they're light and they're coming up against, you know, a you know, a real top team in Donegal who have been buoyed up and, you know, where were they going to figure? And someone said to me in the car park in uh, in, in Rossmore Golf Club, are, are we going to get a hiding tonight, Dick? And that's that's that was potentially on the cards. And because there was just a lot of unknowns, a lot of those young lads, good lads, but are they up at that level? So the fact that we got so many performances of, of new faces and some of the older lads as well put in massive shifts the likes of Darren Hughes and, and Carl O'Connell and the likes. It really encouraging because as I say, we just were sort of almost setting ourselves up. Okay, it's going to be a bit of a transition year and maybe there's not a whole pile to look forward to. Now we're sort of Monday morning, you're looking, yeah, there's plenty there. Okay, you might you're going to be off the, the top two or three a wee bit, but there's, there's plenty there for Monaghan and especially with the younger lads coming in. Um, scoring goals and creating goals, which is not something that we've, been accustomed to far too accustomed to for a tight defence Connor up there on his own so these young lads um, like you said make a wee bit more creative a bit, few more bodies up front allowing themselves um, to play a bit, a bit of ball in the right half of the pitch and, and goals come so very encouraging from a modern point of view absolutely and also football in general as you mentioned yeah, and one thing to look out from a Donegal perspective is the, how serious that soft tissue injury is for Michael Murphy. You know, given the condensed nature of this schedule, you know, a two or three week, four week injury, which for hamstrings would be regular enough, that could really put a huge dent in their chances given they're out first round uh, in Ulster. But Frank, I suppose, which Ulster team after the first two rounds has kind of stood out to you the most, good, positive or, or negatively? Well, there's been positives for all of them. And, and I think that's reflected in, in the table where... You know, everything is still all to play for in, in Division 1 North. Um, I mean, the unusual thing was, I, as, as you alluded to earlier, I've never seen Donegal, I'm not saying I've ever seen them concede four goals. I don't think I've ever seen them cough up eight or nine relatively clear goal scoring chances in the one game. Uh, and I mean, OK, Michael Murphy was off for them. I mean, Michael Murphy, contrary to, to legend, can't do everything. And he wasn't going to be plugging out all those gaps if, if he'd been on the field. Um, that, th- there's huge similarities in a way between the, the, the Monaghan game and what happened with Kerry and, and, and uh, Dublin on Sunday in the sense that you're watching it unfold and you're thinking my God what's gone on what's gone wrong with that Donegal defence are they going to be able to fix it in time for summer and yet they somehow rescued rescued a draw at the end and, and you know showed great kind of conviction to come back and keep plugging away and get a result and that mirrored what Kerry did in Thurless as well. Um, I, I think there are positives for them all. I mean, uh, I, Armagh have, have done well so far. I don't think people would view Armagh, even at this stage, as, you know, serious contenders in the, in the, in the context of, you know, making the lead to all, you know, being an All-Ireland contender. Uh, there would still be a feeling out there that maybe Donegal, and maybe Tyrone, if everything falls into place for them, you know, that they, you know, are the dark horse contenders in Ulster. But they need, you know, they need Michael Murphy back fit in a few weeks. Uh, I mean, you've got to remember, he was absolutely brilliant in 2019. He wasn't the Michael Murphy that we've come to expect last October, November, when the season resumed. And, you know, Donegal really need Michael Murphy as he was playing a week ago for you know, the month of July and, and they would hope into August. There's yeah. just just something, just pulled up the Ulster Ulster draw because these all, you mentioned, uh, well, timing is going to be critical, right? So it's, um, if I've got this right, the weekend of the 26th and the 27th of June for Donegal's first round against Down. Okay, so 
as you said, hamstrings, and we've, we've all pulled them in, in, in our day, depending on how bad it is, it's, it's three, four weeks minimum. Because what they can't afford to do was rush Michael Murphy back for a game, and next thing, bang, it goes again, and next thing he's missing. Because don't think all a tough route to an Ulster final to have that first game against Down. There's something going on in Derry, because they have to then go to Derry, look at the hiding that they've dished out uh, against Fermanagh. So, you know, there's something, there's something happening up there. So, Donegal would just be a wee bit, you know, concerned about, about getting him back soon, but not too soon, that could scupper what's, what's down the line. And, uh, you know, Armagh, keep an eye on Armagh, Frank. Armagh, yeah. there's, there's, they're, they're, those, those two O'Neills, they've, they've, they've seven or eight boys up, in the, up from the front eight up. Mm. Very good footballers and are young. They're all coming up at the same sort of rate. Jamie Clark still has to come back in there somewhere. You know, you're you're looking at hopefully in Monaghan Armagh semi final, which is is shaping up to be a, a real cracker at this stage. And, and in fairness, Reno Neils uh, he definitely claimed assist of the weekend. Like his pass, yes, uh, yeah, the, lovely uh, footballers, lovely footballers. Yeah. It was interesting. We were talking like there. Were, I don't know if epidemic is the right word, but we've had we had a fair clutch of injuries over the weekend of the soft muscle, of the soft tissue variety that Jim Gavin used to always talk about. But actually, looking at them, uh, looking at the TV last night, John Small's one arguably looked the most serious. The way the proper he... Proper pull, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You can uh, see him go. It's like the, the, yeah. the sniper so, that they talk about. <laughs> yeah, but now, the, the one big difference between uh, Dublin and Donegal is that, as you say, you know, Donegal are out in a, a, a losable match at the end of June. Whereas, you know, even if John Small takes five or six weeks, you would still expect that he'd be, you know, back back to full fitness for a match where Dublin might be pushed even to some extent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Usually you'll not see John Small now until maybe <laughs> Leinster final or so, and, and, and that's really all they need to see him at that stage, isn't it? I yeah, know it's yeah. another talking point worth keeping an eye on if there's a kind of a few more of these soft tissue injuries given the condensed nature of the schedule and playing week on week. Uh, Michael, just to kind of wrap up on the football, like any of the results for you across the weekend, like Clare beating Kildare was another huge, you know, uh, win for them and Colin Collins. What a job he, he's been doing. Yeah, it's savage. Like, like Gary Brennan is gone from Clare now as well and they still, they still managed to be pulling out these unbelievable results. They're kind of, they're in pole position to to get, you know, a couple of steps away from Division One football, which, you know, you, you just wouldn't have seen that coming. And in fairness, last year, when, when Gary was missing for the league, Colin just doesn't seem to be one of these guys for excuses at all. He's just next man up, next man up, like like Jim Gavin would have said, or one of the big high-profile managers would have said. He obviously trusts in his squad, and you know, in, in Owen Cleary, he has one of the most in-form attackers at the moment. He put over a, he put over a line ball from the 13 last, last weekend. It was absolutely outrageous. He put over a lovely point from distance yesterday off his, off his left foot. And David Tuberty, who seems to have been playing for Clare for forever, is still is still doing his stuff there as well. So I'd say that's probably the that's probably the result of the weekend because you know generally as an outsider looking in, you're thinking that Clare are potentially gonna gonna struggle once Gary Brennan retires. Kildare obviously beat Cork and beat them reasonably comprehensively first time out, and you're thinking maybe they've turned the tide. But that's that's a huge result for Clare, especially up in Newbridge as well. So that's probably the other standout. And as Dick said, Derry are absolutely flying. Like I'd heard heard that they played uh, they played challenges. The week before the league started, and they they put up high scores, and you know had two big wins. But to, to transfer that across the league has been really really impressive. And like Rory Gallagher has always been, um, whether it's it's not obviously it's not fair or true, but he's always been branded as a defensive manager, and the scores they have put up have been huge. Yeah, so massive. exciting to see what they're going to do as well. Mm. Yeah, Dick. Anyone jumping out to you other than the teams we've discussed? No, uh, maybe mentioned Derry. Shout out to Antrim. Um, you know. There's, 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 there's good stuff, very positive vibes coming out of Belfast, both in hurling and football. And, you know, you know Paddy Cunningham, who, who's of my vintage, you know, hitting the winner, um, looks like they're going to get pushed up. You know, Andy McGinley there obviously coming in. So there's, they're obviously trying to, and I'd sort of be keeping, keeping an eye out. They're, they're, they're trying to, you know, casement, you know, initiative. They're trying to really lift GA across Antrim, GA, across Antrim. And so very heartening to see them see them see them do well um, and as you mentioned you know Colm Collins Claire I'm just looking at the table now they have a tough fixture albeit at home against Cork to put them up but they'll still have a playoff so go well May were just tipping away nicely in the background and I'd say that's just the way they like it nobody's talking about them but they're doing what they need to do putting up good scores and they're just going to 
do what they have to do to get back up into Division 1 and I'd say James Horn would be just quite happy well, and, and remember just what we talked about injuries other top tier teams are having to flog themselves now in the last couple of weeks now, James Horn will be able to rotate the squad mind who he needs to mind to keep everyone fresh and fit for the championship so I'd say over Mayo they're just, they're just happy enough on going under the radar Great stuff Dick thanks for joining us Alright folks good stuff it's time to turn our attention to Hurling Now on the Throw-In Podcast in association with Alliance. We're delighted to welcome Ursula Jacob to the show. Ursula, how are you? And we might start off with, with Waterford's win over Limerick, Ursula. It's, it's a funny one. Like, going in, we thought Limerick were head and shoulders above everyone, yet here we are after three rounds and, and they don't have a win on the board yet. Uh, you know, what have you made of, of how they've been playing? I don't think anyone would have felt that after three weekends that they wouldn't have, you know, got a win out of the first three games, but... Credit to Wadford yesterday. I think Wadford, from my point of view, I think they needed that win over Limerick. You know, the last six games between the teams, you know, Limerick came out on top. And psychologically, this will do Wadford a massive confidence boost uh, for Limerick. I suppose John Kiley probably is in, you know, uncharted waters, really, because he's not used to losing. And now there's two weekends in a row where they've lost. But I don't think they're going to be hitting the panic button just yet. You know, they are missing some key players like Hegarty and Burns and Graham Mulcahy. So, you know, they are trying out certain things. But again, John Kiley being a winner and being a winning manager, he wants to get the win and he has a huge game coming up in two weeks now. So he'll have the next two weeks to prepare for Cork and maybe look at some of the issues, maybe some of the discipline issues. And I think that is creeping in a little bit because, you know, they had two sending offs yesterday as well. And Limerick just can't afford to be losing big guys like, you know, Kyle Hayes or Flanagan who had started the game quite well. Yeah, Frank, it's interesting because even reading John Coyley's comments after the game, he still seemed to be reasonably positive. He was definitely taking a glass half full approach and he was keen to point out that he feels that they are a little bit behind some other teams and the amount of work maybe they've banked at this stage. So maybe the week break could be the ideal time to get more you know, energy into their legs, a bit more work done on the training pitch to maybe catch up. But I suppose a hallmark of their dominance over the last few years has been how they haven't let up, even in the league. They've been very consistent there as well. So does this change things for you maybe going into the championship if they don't have a strong league campaign? Well, I think that air of invincibility that that that, that surrounded Limerick coming out of last season, it, it, it won't be as strong uh, unless they, you know, finish the league really strongly and, and you know, the, after the break, come back with two kind of statement performances. I mean, you've got to remember, uh, not alone did Limerick win the All-Ireland pulling up last year, they won every single game they played in the, I think, the Munster Senior Hurling League, the league, pre-lockdown, uh, and then obviously, um, I think, was it the five rounds of the championship they played? So, you know, they've gone to a scenario where they just about got a draw the first day uh, against Tip, and now they've lost two matches. And coupled with that, they've lost, you know, there was two red cards yesterday and there was a retrospective uh, suspension coming out at the end of the Galway game. So, you know, there will be an element of doubt there uh, I'm not necessarily saying it's it's in Limerick heads, but maybe the opposition will be saying, well, hold on a sec, you know, there are ways of getting at them. Now, I know Michael was at the game yesterday, but it seems like uh, Seamus Flanagan's red card had a pretty profound influence on the game. Uh, the timing of it as well, and it allowed Warford really to grow into the game. I don't know if Michael would, would agree with that, having, having been there in the flesh. Yeah, he was off after 28 minutes and Limerick were going well and he was kind of the focal point of their attack as well. So their attack was quite blunt. Aaron Galan wasn't really up to his up to his usual best. Conor Prunty was kind of uh, dominating him. So once Flanagan went off, they actually didn't score. No forward scored from play in the second half. It's seven place balls and Darrow Donovan got one point from play. So they were kind of... And it allowed Austin Gleeson, who was playing at centre-back, to, to sit back a bit more and, and mop up a bit of ball. And he became really influential in the last quarter. But just uh, just to add into what Frank and Ursula have said, like Limerick have scored one goal since they beat, since they beat Tipperary in the, the Munster semi-final when they scored three goals. After. They've only scored one goal since that was the last day against, against Galway. They conceded their first goal since that day against Tip yesterday. They averaged 30 points a game in Championship last year. They're only averaging just over 21 at the moment and don't look to have that same attack and threat. Uh, John Kiley seems to keep saying that they were that they were back later than most teams. And I know for a fact that they were doing a good bit of heavy training the last couple of weeks. But, you know, they haven't had that same kind of uh, maybe energy or kind of zest to them. They're definitely not as clinical in front of the goals at the moment. And while alarm bells definitely won't be ringing, um, 
you know, the the idea of them chasing every title that they could get and not never taking in a game for for granted. You know, they've been they haven't won yet this year. You know, Waterford were pulling away, if anything, at the finish yesterday, no more than Galway were the week before. So there's definitely a few questions to to, to ask, and I think when their cage has been rattled, they haven't reacted pretty, you know, they haven't reacted very well. Like Kyle Hayes was frustrated at the end and was maybe a bit bottled up and, and lashed out. He's going to be missing for that Cork game in two weeks' time. Flanagan looks like he's going to be missing as well. So that they're going to be down two big players. So um, I definitely think there's lots of, uh, there's lots of, you know, rays of hope for the, for the chase and pack. And from a Waterford point of view, having been beaten by them three times last year in the league and Munster and All-Ireland final and having been beaten by them by 20 points when they played last time in Walsh Park two years ago. This is a big win for them. They, once they were up a man, they really should have been getting the win. And in fairness, Jack Fagan's goal, you know, a brilliant, brilliant catch, beautifully timed. You just don't see that anymore. You don't see a ball put across the square like that anymore. It was a lovely ball across. He timed it perfectly. And C- Caleb Lyons popped up with a point then. and They never really looked like losing thereafter. But yeah, lots of talking points. Alarm bells won't be ringing for Limerick, but definitely offers a, a lot of hope for Waterford. And this is the sort of game, circumstances dictate that they should have been winning. And in fairness to them, they did. Yeah, Nurse, I suppose that was probably the big game of the weekend. The big storyline, though, of the weekend, arguably, is Wexford Kilkenny being called off the positive cases in the Wexford camp, but then subsequently two Clare players being named as close contacts and they weren't allowed or they weren't able to play against Leash. And I suppose given the rivalry and the backstory between the managers on both sidelines, people are asking questions about what, what what's going on. But you could you could sense and see Brian Lowen's frustration you know, yesterday after the game, because I suppose he's looking for answers as much as anyone. And, you know, Claire, you could sense his frustration and kind of confusion around the whole situation. And I suppose we we don't want this creeping into the game. You know, obviously every team and every management team are following COVID-19 protocols uh, and they need to, because at the end of the day, everyone's health and safety is, is the, you know, utmost importance. But I suppose, I think... Clare and other teams deserve that clarity um, and they need to know going forward what is the situation because as Henry Shefflin and uh, Michal Dunhu alluded to last night, you know, you don't want this creeping into the club championship or any, you know, into the inter-county championship either. So it's an unfortunate situation and, you know, I don't think Wexford, you know, want to be hitting the headlines for those reasons either. So you just be hoping that there will be that clarity this this week. And I think Claire really will be uh, looking for some kind of communication coming from the GEA or the HSC or whoever. Yeah, just looking there, Claire have released a statement for the PRO in the last half an hour or so. It doesn't really doesn't really say anything, so I'm not even going to bother reading it out. But there does seem to be, Frank, uh, yeah, as Ursa said, kind of a, a want of clarity, given that if those two players are deemed close contacts, you know, how is no one in the Wexford squad a close contact? Or how have we not had more cases of this if, if a player... Because I think we were of the impression that they, these were casual contacts if you're playing against someone. Well, I, I think the one word uh, I'd use is, uh, and this has been diplomatic, is unusual. It's very, very unusual. I mean, when the story broke on Saturday afternoon that uh, the two uh, Clare players had been deemed close contacts, uh, I kind of rang the Clare PRO, got a quick statement, and they were saying, well, you know, we're following protocols that two of our players have been named as close contacts by Wexford. And I put the phone down and filed something in a hurry, and then I said, I better ring Wexford here. And then, of course, the Wexford chairman was saying, well, actually, no, we haven't named uh, the Clare players as close contacts. That's in, the, that's in the remit of public health and the HSE. But then the question, I suppose, the unanswered question, or who's going to ask the question, answer the question, this is the key one, is, well, the HSE had to get those names from somewhere. You know, and it seems that the two Clare players were marking or being marked by the two Wexford players in question. And I think one of those Wexford players may only have come on as a sub and was, you know, maybe marking this Clare player for 10 minutes or something. Uh, and if that's the case, people, uh, Brian Lohan has every right to ask the question, how are my two players deemed close contacts? And at that stage, remember, there was no Wexford players who were deemed close contacts. And, two, and yet two Clare opponents were, and Clare were down two players for the match at the weekend. Now, it was subsequent to that, that uh, a third Wexford player tested positive and then the match was postponed. But there's an awful lot more clarity needs to be given 
Uh, I'm not 100% sure who exactly will give it or provide it, but I think Crow Park need to say something. Whether the, I'm not saying the HSC are going to come out with a statement, but maybe it has to come via Crow Park. You know, we need to know a bit more and maybe we need to know a bit more from Wexford as well, because all we're getting is, well, there was a follow up. To, like we were under the impression that uh, most or all of the Wexford players, a lot of them had been tested on maybe Wednesday. But then obviously there was fresh rounds of tests conducted on Friday. So, you know, we don't have any more information on how this all unfolded. Uh, so it would be it would be good to get some further clarity, definitely. No, definitely be really interesting to watch that story develop. And even, I suppose, we were talking about the Vant drill earlier and what that might have an impact like in the championship. If there's a case like this in a, in a big championship game or if a, if a star player gets ruled out because he's a close contact in, in a similar way, it, it would be a massive talking point. But so, Michael, to go back to on-field action, Galway Tipperary was another of the kind of heavyweight clashes of the weekend. Very impressive win for Tipperary. They found their goal, goal scoring touch again. Disappointing for Galway, especially after beating Limerick, not to, not to kick on, though. Yeah, you'd imagine like they would have been looking to make it three for three, but it's it's a funny kind of a balance, and we talked about it uh, in the in the football segment there, just about you know uh, the fine line between you know getting guys up to speed and doing plenty of training and, and not pushing lads over the edge. And I think Shane O'Neill was very conscious of say Joe Canning played twenty minutes against Limerick, and then he played you know he played up until the second water break yesterday. He didn't want to push him over the edge. The same uh, John Kiley did similar with Aaron Galan yesterday, and maybe Peter Casey too. So there was a good bit of uh, there was a Shane O'Neill rejig things a lot maybe in the last quarter. Like it, you would say, like if if winning that game was the only thing in their minds, you'd imagine that Canning would have been still on the field at the end. But you're obviously looking a bit further. Um, from a tip point of view, having had really no goal threat against Cork, they had a, a you know a couple of goal chances in the first half. Took two of them. You know, Noel McGrath looks like he's going to be playing in the forwards now. Doesn't look like he's going to be in around the middle of the field anymore. Beautiful little kind of deft hand pass over the shoulder for Jason Ford's goal and a lovely finish for his own goal. And when Ja Mannion was shown the line with 10 or 15 minutes to go, Tip really pushed on and I think they realised uh, that they could shoot from distance and run a matter up over two great scores. Michael Breen came off the bench and caused Adrian Tui a lot of trouble, got two great points as well. And, you know, having drawn their first two games and probably went with safety first and security first at the back, Tip we're still secure at the back, but showed a little bit more going forward. And I think that's what Sheedy will be looking to do. Keep it really tight at the back while uh, still having that attack and threat. And just about keeping it tight at the back, Cottle Barrett gave one of the, one of the great performances from a cornerback the other day. Like it's very rare you see cornerbacks in the headline, but he was, he was literally flawless from, from start to finish. And, you know, he's just, he's such a, like a dynamic kind of force of nature almost. And he's such an inspirational uh such an inspirational figure for them. He was huge. On, on, you know, a couple of days after they lost, another inspiration in, in Bonner Matter looks like he's going to be out for the year now with an Achilles injury as well. And I know Liam Sheedy talked about how important he was to the, is to them and he, how he's a spiritual leader. So a big win for Tip, but obviously came at a loss a few days before that with Bonner. But uh, yeah, like listen, they're both they're both learning. They're both learning as they go. Um, like if the league was the sole priority for Galway, I'd imagine they would have been going, going gung ho for that game the other day, and it didn't necessarily look like they were. Yeah, as you mentioned, Bonner Mar rotten injury look after having the ACL injury as well prior to that and missing a huge chunk of time. Is there still like what jumped out to you from the match? You know, Michael touched on a few points there. Is there anything in particular you found interesting about either team? Yeah, I suppose Tipperary will be happy also, you know, as Michael alluded to, you know, they they, they brought on a number of players as well, like Michael Breen, Paul Flynn got a good score, uh, Niall O'Mara. So it's, you know, I think Sheedy definitely is looking to strengthen the team overall and having those kind of subs like the Limericks when maybe in the closing stages of a game, you need these guys coming on. And yesterday or on Saturday, Tipperary got five points from subs. So that's that's definitely a huge positive for Tipperary. And he's just trying to get that fine balance between the leaders in the team, like the Noel McGraths, the Jason Fords, but then getting the balance with some of the new guys like the Paddy Cadells, Dylan Quirks, even getting more out of the likes of Jake Morris. So I think overall, you know, Sheedy will be happy. As he would have said, uh, you know, they had a, a huge amount of wides again, but at least they're creating those opportunities. And I think he will be happy that he did get two goals yesterday. 
Yeah, just uh, reading out something here just on the Wexford discussion. Wexford chairman Michal Moran describes Brian Lohan's claim that Wexford player nominated Clare players as close contacts as outrageous and calls for him to retract them. So already, you know, if we're, as we're recording this, things are moving at, at a very <laughs> fast pace. So God knows what it'll be like by the time people are listening to this, maybe in an hour or two's time. Uh, Frank, I suppose in terms of uh, of teams trying to find goal scoring touches and Cork have 14 goals through three games. Now I know as Westmead would probably be seen as, as the, the weaker team in that group, but even before that five against Waterford and two against Tipperary, they do seem to have put a, a real emphasis on, on going for those green flags this year. Oh, they were. And, uh, and I mean, uh, you know, the quality, the quality of some of the finishing as well, you can argue, you know, Westmead were, were wide open, but, uh, I think it's, is it Alan uh, Connolly, I think, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, 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 his second finish, especially yesterday. I mean, he looks like he has the look of a real poacher about him. Uh, and we saw that in the earlier match, I think, against, against Waterford as well. So, uh, I mean, it's, as we were having with the football discussion earlier, it's very hard to make definitive judgments uh, in a match, it's impossible when you're winning by 33 points or whatever whatever it was. I mean, I think the meeting in two weeks' time against Limerick, that will tell us an awful lot more about Cork as we're heading closer to championship. Uh, and even more so because you can imagine that Limerick will they'll focus a fair bit more, I think, on getting being closer to being right, you know, up to championship pace for that game. So I think that'll be really fascinating to, to, to watch that. I mean... The funny thing about the hurling league, and I don't know if Michael would agree, it's you're we're looking for signals where you know you're enjoying the matches, but we're wondering as it gets closer to the end game, you know, you know, it's not as if we're going to have teams battling for a league title. It won't really seem like that. And you're, I'm just wondering how the last week or two will will pan out, because we've even seen it in previous years where the football league would start in a blaze of glory in the first, you know, the end of January into February. Uh, and then the last few rounds of kind of, unless your teams were in a relegation dogfight, kind of didn't matter as much for some counties, so long as they were safe, you know. So um, I just hope that the league doesn't kind of peter out a little bit as we get, as we move into May. Yeah, Michael, do you want to come in on that one? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a fair point. Like Limerick play Cork in two weeks and then like they'd be hoping to get a result there, but they play Westmead in the, in the last game. Like, so that's their last prep for championship and they would probably be even experimenting in that game. And once you get that close, the championship is so close to that fifth round that you wonder how, how much will, will managers be risking, you know, starting their best 15 with the chance of picking up a muscle injury that could see you out for the whole championship. So yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely take Frank's point on board. If there was a bigger gap between, you know, league and championship starting, you could probably go at your, your best 15. And if, if anything happens, you have a couple of weeks to regroup, but it's so close and it's it's all about, we just Liam Cattle was saying even yesterday, it's just it's such a that's such a fine balance between getting everybody up to speed and not losing anybody. And I think uh, it's it's almost like you know with, like you talk about with Leinster rugby and that managing guys' time. And I'd say they're really really you know fine balance on you know how much time has this guy had and not letting guys over certain thresholds for the for the you know the possibility of picking up injuries. But it's definitely the negativity that reigned in the first couple of weeks has has quelled somewhat as the league goes on. That was probably only natural given that just teams were so rusty, referees are so rusty, rules are so kind of new and even, you know, how seismic the rules were. So the, the quality of fair is definitely getting a good bit better. Yeah, the other point, Will, I'd, I'd, sorry, just got in there, is that when we were talking earlier about um, at halftime the Dublin-Kerry game, whether, you know, is the All-Ireland race over? Like, if Kerry aren't able to put it up to Dublin, is that it? Even though we've had some brilliant matches in the football, you look at the hurling scenario, all it takes is for Limerick to come down a few notches and you could have five or six counties, you know, who are all in that, potentially in that All-Ireland mix. It, it still remains, I think, a much more open championship when we're talking about giving out the big, the big canisters like Lee McCarthy and Sam, Sam, uh, and Sam McGuire. So, I mean, you know, it'll, I just think we've seen it, like all, all, it, ta- all it takes for Limerick to slip a little bit and there's a host of counties. Might be only five, five or six. Five or six counties chasing in all Ireland is a huge, is a huge shortlist. And just on that, Will, there's more hope for those other counties now. Galway have more hope. Tip have more hope. And Waterford, after winning yesterday, have more hope as well. 
Yeah, that's why the Limerick Cork game in two weeks' time was very interesting, given they play in the first round of the championship. Cork are going well, Limerick haven't won a game. So it'll even be interesting to see, you know, if Limerick can get a blow over Cork before they play. I think it's maybe four weeks later. So yeah, it's it's, it's all of a sudden it's very wide open in the hurlinger, or so it seems. Ursula, I'd be interested to get your opinion on, on the Camogie League two two rounds in. I know some of the big guns weren't in action over the weekend, you know, Cork, Kenny, I think, and Galway had the weekend off. But of the teams that did win, you know, you had Tip beating Waterford, Offaly beating Dublin, Limerick beating I think Claire like anyone standing out to you there uh, Tip and Watford there's never much between it but to be honest going into the, looking ahead of those games I would have felt probably Dublin and Clare were going to come out on the winning side but credit to Offaly and Limerick they had really impressive wins I suppose you can't you know you can't go without mentioning Grania Egan you know 3-5 for Offaly Michael will be happy with that with Offaly's win anyway she kicked um, one nine for the footballers yesterday yeah, as well. Yeah. Like, you know, phenomenal. And she deserves that credit because I was looking at the highlights of the game and some of the scores that she got and the goals were really impressive. And Dublin would have been going in as favourites so that we, you know, in that game. And in fairness to Susan Erner, the new Offaly manager, you know, former Galway player, she seems to have them well structured and well organised. So Offaly will be getting lots of confidence because in the last couple of years, they haven't been winning too many games. The same with Limerick, you know, uh, that was a, a big win against Clare. Clare had put it really up to Galway the previous week. And, you know, Cueva Costello, 2-6 in that game yesterday. You know, massive score. And, and again, Limerick will take huge confidence from that. But in that tip water game, I think the standout player again was caught the van. 12 points, three from play. Um, you know, some massive score. And, and she really is the leader of that team. But tip are very, very impressive right throughout. Defensively, they were very strong. Mary Ryan, full-back, Karen Kendi, centre-back. Um, so, yeah, it's, Waterford have it all to play for and all to do against Cork next week. So, yeah, it's, it's, the league is going good. The standard is quite good. You could see the rustiness out of the teams that maybe were only out for the first time yesterday. But lots of learnings for some of the, the new managers over the teams. But huge wins for Offaly and Limerick in, in particular yesterday. Yeah, and also in terms of obviously, you know, the big three that I mentioned, Cork, Kenny and Galway, who have dominated the, the, the yeah. All-Ireland. Uh, like, is there any other team do you think that can make a step up this year? Well, I think Tip are really, they have really been pushing the last couple of years. You know, they're trying to edge into that top three. You know, they've reached the last couple of semi-finals, and they did quite well last year against Galway and the previous year against Cork. But again, maybe there has been in the past that over reliance on the likes of Cork Devan in, in the tip forward line. But they seem to be getting that little bit more physically stronger. Um, you know, the use of the ball against Watford in particular at the weekend was really impressive, and some of the new younger girls like Claude and McIntyre. Uh, Ema McGrath got a super goal so it's just I think if, if Tip can find maybe another one or two players that can really strengthen the Tip attack I think they really will push to get into that top three but I think this year you know Bill Milani you know they will be trying to edge and beat one of those big teams um, aside from that I think the likes of um, I think the likes of obviously Offaly and Limerick and them but Clare I was really impressed with them last weekend against Galway I think they probably should have finished out that game against Galway, but it's getting that little bit more experience and consistency. So they reached the quarterfinal last year. So I think they'd be hoping to push on possibly to a semi-final stage this year. Well, that's all we have time for this week on the Throw On Podcast in association with Ali Inch. I'd like to thank Ursula, Michael and Frank for joining me as well as Dick Clark and earlier. We'll be back next week with another podcast. And in the meantime, you could subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud or listen on independent.ie. So until next time, thanks for listening and goodbye. Allianz. Supporting all 32 counties through the Allianz Leagues.